Good evening, everybody. Wow, what a great crowd. I think we'll have a great discussion, too, for our great crowd. Welcome. Uh, my name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics here at Harvard. I want to welcome everybody to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum for our third Blockbuster Forum this week. Uh, I still want to welcome, there's a lot of new faces here, so welcome to all the freshmen and first-year graduate students at the Kennedy School and elsewhere, and everybody else who's here at the Forum. We're going to have a great discussion on a pretty important topic. Uh, tonight's discussion is going to be moderated by the founding dean of the Modern Kennedy School, the architect, the visionary that helped to create the Forum, uh, Graham Allison, who's the director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and the Dillon Professor here at the Kennedy School. So please join me in welcoming Graham. Well, thank, thanks very much. We've got a great panel tonight and a great topic. Uh, the Belfer Center is one of the sister centers of the Institute of Politics here at the school, and the panelists come from the Belfer Center, among other things. You can read about their resumes in your program, uh, but there are another two dozen people who might just as well be part of this discussion and argument, a number of them in the audience, and so when we get to the audience component, I hope they'll jump in, uh, as well as there'll be opportunities for students to, uh, or fellows or anybody else to ask their own questions. But before we start, let me uh, propose that we remember uh, just for a minute that this is an anniversary. It's an important anniversary here in the U.S., the 12th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon that killed uh, 3,000 people including uh, citizens of 90 countries. So I'd say just to think for a second about maybe somebody you knew. So thank you. So the topic tonight is Syria. The issue before the House, as the program states, is to attack or not to attack. Well, there's two choices, yes or no. And actually, just yesterday, the Belfer Center communications team put up a one-stop sh shopping website on the Syria issue that gives you the facts about the case, as well as identifies what the editors think are the best analyses for attacking and the best analyses against attacking and then their best commentaries on other related topics that somebody might want to look at and think about before choosing between attack or not attack. But tonight, before the House, is the question, if you were a member of Congress and you were required to vote on the resolution that President Obama put to the members of Congress, which now you've gotten a postponement for, but we're imagining Tonight, you had to vote. How would you vote? And we're going to start with our panelists who are going to give a chance to say what they would vote, yes or no. And then always, since bees, anybody who's academics will say yes, and it's more complicated than that, that's okay. But yes or no. And at the end of the evening, we're going to give you a chance in the audience to vote if you were a member of Congress tonight, and if you had to vote, yes or no. You can only choose two choices. What do, what's your choice? So, 10 days ago, and our, 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 our panel, as I say, you can uh, read their resumes, because if I spent time to, telling you, we would be here the whole time. Nicholas Burns is a professor of practice here at the Kennedy School, former Undersecretary of State for Policy and many other things. Uh, Marissa Porges, next door, is a former Navy pilot now PhD, a fellow at the Belfer Center. Neil Ferguson is a professor of history at Harvard as well as a member of the board of the Belfer Center. Joe Nye, my colleague, is a professor here at the Kennedy School, former dean of the school, former head of the National Intelligence Council. So read their resumes, but we're not going to do that for right now. Okay? So just uh, this has been such a swirl of events on Syria, it's quite hard to keep, you know, keep one's bearings. But 10 days ago, after having been a drumbeat that had led to what was apparently going to be 
a dis an announcement that the U.S. was going to attack Syria, and where one of my friends, actually somebody who used to work here at the school, who's Deputy Secretary of Defense, was thinking, you know, they were just going to get an order and they were going. President Obama went to the Rose Garden and surprised the world, including most of the people in his national security team, by calling timeout and asking Congress, putting to Congress, this issue and proposing that Congress vote to authorize his use of a limited, proportionate military attack on Syria to punish. Syrian use of chemical weapons and to deter future use. Let's hear what he had to say. Ten days ago, the world watched in horror as men, women, and children were massacred in Syria in the worst chemical weapons attack of the 21st century. Now, this attack is an assault on human dignity. It also presents a serious danger to our national security. It risks making a mockery of the global prohibition on the use of chemical weapons. It endangers our friends and our partners along Syria's borders, including Israel, Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon, and Iraq. It could lead to escalating use of chemical weapons or their proliferation to terrorist groups who would do our people harm. In a world with many dangers, this menace must be confronted. Now, after careful deliberation, I have decided that the United States should take military action against Syrian regime targets. This would not be an open-ended intervention. We would not put boots on the ground. Instead, our action would be designed to be limited in duration and scope. But I'm confident we can hold the Assad regime accountable for their use of chemical weapons deter this kind of behavior, and degrade their capacity to carry it out. But having made my decision as Commander-in-Chief based on what I am convinced is our national security interests, I'm also mindful that I'm the President of the world's oldest constitutional democracy. I've long believed that our power is rooted not just in our military might, but in our example as a government of the people by the people and for the people. And that's why I've made a second decision. I will seek authorization for the use of force from the American people's representatives in Congress. Okay. So uh, you're each imaginary members of Congress tonight. And you're required to vote tonight, yes or no. And then you can have 30 more seconds to say but but you've got to start with either yes or no. Let's start with Nick. I would vote yes in support of President Obama's policy, limited airstrikes designed to degrade, degrade Assad's military capacity and to deter future use and to intimidate him. But I'd say two more things, Gray, and an explanation of that vote. That airstrikes alone do not constitute a coherent strategy for the United States and Syria. And if we're out of the regime change business, and we are out of it, there's no congressional, public, or governmental support for it. I think the United States would have to quickly pivot after the use of airstrikes to a diplomatic campaign with Russia, with the Arab states, with Turkey, and hopefully with Iran to do two things. One, launch a massive international relief operation for the two million Syrians who are refugees outside their borders, the four million Syrians displaced within the country, and in honor of the 110,000 people who've died, to make sure that number doesn't double or triple. And finally, if the United States uh, is not going to replace Assad, and we won't, we're going to have to try to engineer a ceasefire in that war because it is destabilizing all the countries we care about in that region. Okay. That's clear. Marissa, you would vote yes or no? I would not support the proposed limited strike. Well, you would vote no. I would vote no. I do not think it would meet the objectives that you just described. I don't think it would uh, effectively punish the Assad regime nor deter the future use of such weapons by either the regime or other nations. I think the limited strike, as it was described, is not timely enough nor proportionate enough 
nor credible at this point. Um, what's more, I actually think it would have serious negative repercussions. I think you would likely see Assad making more overt uh, efforts to take a stand against such unilateral American <coughs> action, which would result in massive casualties, more civilian deaths in Syria. And I think it would actually incite more anti-Western sentiment, more anti-Americanism in the region broadly and also specifically in Syria. And I think that's too great a risk to run for this type of, uh, of act. I do, however, think from a broader perspective, I agree exactly with Nick's proposal that the bigger picture needs to be taken into account here. Um, if we're really looking to do something, we need to look towards greater you know, humanitarian aid to Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, those, uh, the internally and externally displaced refugees, um, and to aggressively push for a diplomatic solution that would make an end to the greater problem here, which is not just the 1,400 people killed in this chemical attack, but the 100,000 that have died more broadly in the war. Clear. Neil, yes or no? Well, I would have voted yes if I'd been asked the question that you've asked. But of course, that's not the situation we find ourselves in. Last night, the president no, but went we're on go, television. We're going to, to, to we're gonna go secondly but let, let to me, where we are. Let please. me finish. Yeah. I mean, that's about the president, <laughs> if I may, said I, I would have voted yes if, we, if we'd been asked that question. But, but extraordinarily, last night, the president went on there, began by making the case for uh, military action, and then concluded with a rousing call to postponement, uh, a rare, I think, rhetorical yeah. device in the history of the presidency. <laughs> and I must say, I share the reservations of um, members of Congress on both sides about the way that this has been handled, and it didn't surprise me in the least that so few people were willing uh, to step up in support of what was proposed. Uh, and I think they, they, they had good reasons for doubt. Of course, as you can tell from my funny accent, I'm British, so we've already voted on this. Exactly. Uh, and we were given a straightforward question. The Prime Minister did uh, put it before the House of Commons, and I would have voted yes, uh, and I would have been on the losing side, uh, as indeed uh, I would have been if I'd been able to vote yes in, in the United States. I take a slightly different view from the others in two regards. I think we should have intervened earlier, and I think our aim should have been regime change. I'm very close in my thinking to John McCain on this, somebody I used to advise long ago in the previous life. And I share his deep gloom at the way in which this has been handled. We have indeed left it <coughs> much too late, and the consequences of this dithering are already deeply tragic, not just for the people of, of Syria, uh, but for the people of all the neighboring countries that are being destabilized by this. So in the end, what we were supposed to be voting on were incredibly small strikes that would not, in my view, have had any positive benefit except to salvage some credibility for a president who'd drawn a red line and then tried to turn it into a pink dotted line. Uh, now we're in an even worse position where he's decided not to have any credibility uh, and to go down what is a primrose path uh, led by President Putin in the direction, I think, of an Assad victory in the Civil War with potentially double or treble the deaths that we've seen so far. It's an extremely depressing situation we find ourselves in, ladies and gentlemen, and it's been a long time, I'm afraid, since we've seen a diplomatic crisis mishandled in this way. It should become a case study, I think, at the Kennedy School, about how not to be president in the crisis. Other than that, Neil is for it, okay? So, <laughs> no, yes or no? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I'd support the president on a limited strike to reinforce the norm against the use of chemical weapons. But I think what's interesting it, it for students to realize is, notice that when you get down to a binary decision, yes or no, how much you're covering over that's much more interesting. For example, Neil and I deeply disagree. I think we should not be involved in regime change. I think the Arab countries in the Middle East are going through a set of revolutions which are theirs. And the more we interfere with it, the worse we're going to make it. And therefore, we ought to stay out of regime change. So, so Neil and I wind up both voting yes, but for totally different reasons, opposite ends of the spectrum. So I think the, the, the lesson of this is uh, when you get down to binary decisions, yes, no, you start covering over the most interesting questions. I think the most interesting question now, uh, to follow up on Neil's uh, analysis, is uh, can Obama make lemonade out of this lemon? Okay, and I think that's where we're going to go now. So good, and thank you very much for yeses or no. So 
Interestingly, after 10 days of making the case, or doing his best to make the case, to Congress, to the American public, to the world, actually, at the G20 meeting, then uh, last night we heard President Obama speak again on the topic. So again, let's see what he said. When dictators commit atrocities, they depend upon the world to look the other way until those horrifying pictures fade from memory. But these things happened. The facts cannot be denied. The question now is what the United States of America and the international community is prepared to do about it. And that is why, after careful deliberation, I determined that it is in the national security interests of the United States to respond to the Assad regime's use of chemical weapons through a targeted military strike. The purpose of this strike would be to deter Assad from using chemical weapons, to degrade his regime's ability to use them, and to make clear to the world that we will not tolerate their use. However, over the last few days, we've seen some encouraging signs in part because of the credible threat of U.S. military action, as well as constructive talks that I had with President Putin, the Russian government has indicated a willingness to join with the international community in pushing Assad to give up his chemical weapons. The Assad regime has now admitted that it has these weapons, and even said they joined the Chemical Weapons Convention, which prohibits their use. It's too early to tell whether this offer will succeed and any agreement must verify that the Assad regime keeps its commitments. But this initiative has the potential to remove the threat of chemical weapons without the use of force, particularly because Russia is one of Assad's strongest allies. I have therefore asked the leaders of Congress to postpone a vote to authorize the use of force while we pursue this diplomatic path. I'm sending Secretary of State John Kerry to meet his Russian counterpart on Thursday, and I will continue my own discussions with President Putin. I've spoken to the leaders of two of our closest allies, France and the United Kingdom, and we will work together in consultation with Russia and China to put forward a resolution at the UN Security Council requiring Assad to give up his chemical weapons and to ultimately destroy them under international control. Meanwhile, I've ordered our military to maintain their current posture to keep the pressure on Assad and to be in a position to respond if diplomacy fails. Okay, so Neil, you already have suggested a little bit about your view of how this is working out. I want to do another hypothetical. So let's imagine a Martian strategist who's watching this play of events. And she's now going to assess the actions of the Russians, Putin and Lavrov, of Assad, who said okay, and of Obama, who said just what he said last night. So how is she likely, likely to rank these uh, as strategic players in a game in which they're not all necessarily agreed? So why don't we start with you and then we'll let the others say what they think. Yeah? Well, from a Martian standpoint, the uh, obvious game plan in Moscow is to protract what will be a complex process at the UN, uh, embarrassing still further the United States in the process by making sure that any resolution is uh, s too soft uh, to have uh, a threat of military action behind it, uh, while at the same time trying to set in motion a prolonged game of hunt the chemical weapons. Uh, this was probably once a popular game on Mars <coughs> until the chemical weapons went off and depopulated that fair planet. <laughs> the, uh, the Martian, therefore, would bet on Putin to be Putin, uh, to be Machiavellian, duplicitous, insincere, all the things that he has been, as, a, as one would expect a KGB veteran to be. 
The Martian, I think, would also expect Assad to go along with this. Assad has now transformed his chemical weapons from weapons into bargaining chips in the diplomatic game. And he, therefore, is incented to do more interviews with Charlie Rose. He does a good interview, you have to admit. Uh, uh, come across as a reasonable person who, do I, I, you know, I'd completely forgotten I had these chemical weapons, but now that you mention it, yes, uh, we do have them. They're extremely widely dispersed, so it'll take about a thousand inspectors the better part of a year in peacetime. Unfortunately, we do have a civil war going on, so that probably is going to take a bit longer than a year, but that's fine. We'll cooperate with you over the two-year period that will take uh, to identify where the weapons are, and the Martian will then look at uh, President Obama and shake her head, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, what a mess you have made. And you are a lame duck president and you've <laughs> lamed yourself. Unusually, presidents usually become lame ducks because of the actions of others, but this president has made himself a lame duck by falling into a trap of his own making, shooting his own duck feet. And I don't think he's now got much alternative but to follow Putin and Assad down this path. Because what's his alternative? If they are insincere, which they are. At some point he says, this is a sham, you're not serious. I'm going right back to Congress and I'm going to ask for those incredibly small airstrikes that, uh, that Secretary Kerry promised. Actually, let's make a firework display. Maybe Congress will support that. And, uh, and Congress will probably not even support a firework display over Damascus. Right. So he, to use a, a technical term um, from diplomacy, he is screwed. Okay, good. Marissa, you... Martian you, diplomacy. You agree, agree or disagree or... Um, I agree in part, at least with the assessment of the proposed plan and the likely outcome. It will be incredibly hard. It's going to be incredibly hard to even come to the terms of the plan, but insofar as there's a civil war going on and the UN inspection inspectors have already had trouble even assessing what happened in the attack, Anything to do with accessing the weapons, valuing them, destroying them, removing them, all that, it's likely impossible. And I agree that they're being duplicitous, it's a, a waiting game, and they're trying to draw it out. But I disagree with the potential ability uh, of Obama and others to use this as a tool to maneuver into a better position. I think what's been missing is more track to dialogue to push a, yeah, rather a multilateral response. If this can be used to draw a new line in the sand, a new red line, as it were, although we probably shouldn't use that term anymore. Um, I think it's something that in the future could be used when it's crossed to not just have a unilateral action that is not supported by any of our European allies, much less the Arabs, much less many in Syria, um, but a more multilateral response. Um, and uh, so I do think that it could be turned into a better outcome than uh, Neil's dire prognosis. Okay, I think that uh, Nick probably agrees with the, la the last point you made. So Nick, can you say succinctly what your view about this is, and then sure. Joe's, yeah? And then we're going to move to another topic, yep? Sure. The first thing I'd like to say is that uh, I have enormous sympathy for President Obama. Easy for us okay. to be... Absolutely. Easy for us Sitting to be on the sidelines, you can be critical all the time, yep. Theodore Roosevelt said, famous speech at the Sudbun is not the critic who counts. The credit belongs to the man or woman in the arena. He's in the arena. And I think any administration would have a tough time with this problem, number one. Number two, this is not the administration's best day. We're in a very disadvantageous position. Putin has framed this diplomatic gambit in a way that's not in our interest. I think the president had no choice but to walk down that diplomatic path on Monday, once the offer was made, given the consequences internationally and domestically had he not done that. But we have now have to be tough as nails in these negotiations that begin tomorrow in Geneva between Sergei Lavrov, who's a difficult character, and Secretary of State John Kerry. Yes, you dealt with him more I, than once. I did deal with him. And I, I, the way I'd see it, Graham, is that um, the United States has to insist on the following. A very short time frame for Assad to identify the chemical weapons sites. Uh, the transfer of those chemical weapons to a reputable, credible international organization, not to the Russian government. And an enforcement mechanism so that when Syria tries to renege on the deal, I think that's very probable, the United States or France could then take military action. Here's the problem. Putin is already on record saying he doesn't agree to the enforcement mechanism. He said it publicly last evening in Moscow. That's why the president, I think, didn't lay down any conditions last night. Mm -hmm. I think he, wants, he doesn't want a public fight right now with, with Putin. He's trying to give Secretary Kerry flexibility as he should, but at some point, 
we may have to walk away from this Security Council resolution that the French have drafted, the French will table it tomorrow, because I don't think the Russians and Chinese will go for it, that then brings us back to some kind of vote to authorize force in Congress or unilateral action if the United States is to have any credibility left at the end of the day. Joseph? Well, it, from my Martian perspective, uh, I look down and I see that uh, here's President Obama who's gotten himself into a box. He's made statements about red lines. He's then asked for the public opinion and the Congress to back him up. Turns out he's going to lose. If he continues on the path he's on, he loses his personal prestige. He also loses national prestige. Very costly. Then along comes this fellow over in Russia who doesn't like him much, who bails him out, who gets him out of the box. And I say as a Martian, why in the world would he do that? And the answer may be partly to embarrass Obama, but he'd be, Obama would be even more embarrassed if Putin hadn't gotten him out of this box. So maybe it's because Putin has two other objectives. He wants to keep his influence in the Middle East. He's a second-rate power, no longer a superpower. This is a place for him to play at the center of the stage. The second thing is he does worry about al-Qaeda and the fundamentalist branch of the opposition coming to power. And so in that sense, Putin has given Obama a get-out-of-your-box free card. Now, what can you do with that? Now, so that's the strategist, the Martian strategist analyst a view of the, of the two situations. Yeah. What can you do with that? If I were Obama and playing his hand, I would say, don't demand Chapter 7 under the UN, which involves mandatory uh, action military, or allows that action, making it legal. Just go for a modest resolution under Chapter 6. Assad should give up his weapons, or let the UN take care of the weapons. It's going to be very hard to do that. There are more than 40 sites. We don't know where they all are. There's a civil war going on, so forth. So will that work or not? Not clear. You may not actually have to get all those weapons to accomplish Obama's objective, which is to deter, to limit them and deter their use again. And if it doesn't work, in other words, if that stretching out doesn't work, then you've got to make sure that Obama plays his hand in such a way that he doesn't allow somebody to restrain him, whether it's the UN or the Congress. So Obama uses Putin's get out of your box free card to get a UN resolution which appears not to have a bite, but which stretches out the situation on chemical weapons in such a way that they're not usable, but if Assad, in desperation, violates that and uses them, Obama then goes and does what he said, right. strikes. If it doesn't help Neil, who wants to overthrow Assad, okay. since I'm not in that business, but in the business of deterring the use of chemical weapons, yeah. it actually is not a bad strategy. Okay. 15 seconds, Neil, and but then we need the next question. I'm not the only person trying to overthrow mm -hmm. Assad. That's yeah. why there's a civil exactly. war going right. on. And, and the problem about this analysis is that it assumes everybody stops while the diplomatic charade plays out, but in fact the civil war con continues and probably Today, escalates yes. because Assad mm -hmm. now has a green light to use everything else except chemical weapons mm -hmm. to try and win this war. And the Russians are in a perfect position to help him do that because the world is watching this diplomatic farce. So m my concern about where we are at the moment is that at the very least the civil war is going to continue. And as, as Nick rightly said, the ramifications for the region are already deeply destabilizing. Look at Jordan which is probably proportionately the most affected by the refugee crisis. While Obama is sitting saying, oh, I'm out of my box, and the Martians are going, he's out of his box for free, this crisis is going to go off in a whole bunch of different directions. And guess who is really impotent? The President of the United States. And who's the power broker? The second-rate power. The Russians have put themselves in the position of being the brokers, but they're not impartial. They're on one side in the Civil War. So, I, I so mean, much, me as I'd like, much as I'd love to agree with Joe occasionally <laughs> we do on this one, I mean, this is not a get out of jail card. It's not nothing like it. So here we're having a debate among policy wonks, and policy wonks love to debate with each other or to discuss. But I would say if you look at the policy community, Republican and Democrat, folks like this, 75% of them are yes but for doing something. 
It's about at least 75%. There's another population in the country, though. It's called Americans. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about the American people? So we used to have a great colleague here from whom all, all of us had a chance to learn, Ernest May. And we had a discussion here in the forum back in 1995 on lessons of Vietnam as they relate to decisions to attack people or go to war. And Ernie argued in that, we're going to see a clip here, that uh, the conduct of foreign policy when attacking countries or making war is not primarily a conduct of relations with other governments. It is primarily a matter of domestic leadership. Well, let's hear what Ernie said. And there is finally, uh, there is an implicit lesson in the book, not, uh, not one of the 11 that he gives, I think, which is, uh, I think, a terribly important lesson because it runs against the conventional wisdom that is taught uh, in this university and uh, around the world about international relations. Because uh, as I read it, he is saying that uh, what his uh, painful voyage with regard to the Vietnam War was a a voyage of discovery about the relationship between the government and the people in the United States. And the, the implicit lesson is that the conduct of foreign policy is not primarily uh, the conduct of relations with other government. It is primarily a matter of domestic leadership. Okay. Yes. So when we ask, uh, well, where is Ernie now that we need him? Unfortunately, deceased, a great source of wisdom and inspiration to all of us. But if we look at where the American people are a month into this discussion, let's, let's see some poll numbers here just for a second. I mean, essentially, they're not buying. Right. Have we got a, a slide with some poll numbers? Uh, basically, the message is on yes or no, 60% yeah. solid no. Should Congress authorize 60% no? So the U.S. interests to be involved in the conflict in Syria, 60% no. So what is it that Americans know that folks like us don't know? Or yeah. how, do we, how do we deal with this? Joe? Yeah, I think the most interesting thing about both those numbers and Ernie May's wise advice is how extraordinary public opinion changed in 12 years. And I'm, I was dean when 9-11 happened. I remember standing here at the podium having a public forum here in the school trying to make sense of it. And the mood of should we do something about Afghanistan, do we have to reply to Al-Qaeda, was very strong. And the idea that you would go in 12 years from a situation where, remember, a majority of the Congress supported the mistaken invasion of Iraq that's, people like to bury that now, but it's, it, but it's true, including many Democrats, to a situation where you can't even get Republicans to support a president who is willing to have a limited strike against Syria, what an extraordinary shift that is. And then you go back to the history and you say, you know, we've seen this before. America goes through cycles like this. After Truman and Korea, Eisenhower pulled back. After Vietnam, where Kennedy and Johnson got us overextended, you found Nixon basically pulling back. And after the excesses of George W. Bush in response to 9-11, you're finding Obama in a situation where he doesn't try to pull back, he's being pulled back. That's, so Ernie May's wisdom here is exactly right. Nick? I agree with Joe. Um, Obviously, looking back on Vietnam, that was one reference point in 1995 for Americans. And then reflecting, uh, as Joe did, on the last decade, we tried, we invaded and then occupied two Arab Muslim, Muslim countries for over a decade. You need public support to sustain yourself. I think Syria is different, however. In 1995, when Ernie was speaking, I don't know what month that was, but I was part of the Clinton administration when, in a very unpopular move, President Clinton put 50,000 American troops into Bosnia 
at the end of November 1995 to implement the Dayton Accords. And I, I was spokesperson of the State Department, so I was paying attention to the polls. The polls were running, uh, the polls were greater in opposition than they are now. But in a limited use of force, I think we have to ask the president to use his or her best judgment. And I think if the president had taken action two weeks ago and not asked the Congress to authorize, people wouldn't have been you know, in favor by wild percentage points. But a president would have made, he would have exercised his constitutional duty. He would have backed up his own threats to Assad. And he generally would have had the support of a lot of countries around the world for a limited action. So I think there are some lessons. And sometimes presidents have to do what they think is right. Which um, I, have, I also disagree, but for a slightly different reason. I think the Syria case is, is very different than, than things were 12 years ago. So I think some of it is a shift in general public perception. Americans are generally tired of intervention and the rest. But I think that the case has not been made in this instant, the case for why this impacts US national security, why it is a direct, directly affects us and our interests. I don't think that case has been made strongly enough by the administration. So I think that is one of the key reasons why you have seen so much opposition to this type of intervention. Because I think when it is explained, it's, pre it's presented as we're trying to preserve an international norm. We may be flouting international law to do so unilaterally as well, but that's the role we should play. And I don't think that is, after 12 years of war, persuasive enough for the American people. Um, and I would also take a, another tact on this type of question when you're looking at the perception of domestic leadership here. I don't think that this single issue will entirely undermine the president's credibility writ large with regard to national security. Yes, right now we're embroiled in it. Yes, it's on everyone's mind, the front pages of the paper, and all we're thinking of is what is Iran thinking? What is North Korea thinking? What is Russia thinking? Will it impact the president's ability to take any decisive action if we are directly threatened? But I think in the long term, this will be a blip on the radar, the same way it will be for the British when they, they overruled the intentions of, of, of what the politicians thought and then the people didn't agree. Um, because I think at the end of the day, we'll look to what's been happening over the past 10 years, aggressive action by the US, unilateral in some instances, and it has continued under President Obama. Unilateral drone strikes in Yemen, North Africa, elsewhere. The ability, you know, the willingness to go into Pakistan with special forces and, and target bin Laden. I think those instances will hold sway in the long term when our allies and our enemies are, are looking to what kind of credibility the US administration, this president, and future presidencies has. Neil, let me come finally to you with, with this one, because last night when we had this discussion with Richard Huss, where you were here, I quoted the uh, op-ed that uh, Peggy Noonan had in the Wall Street Journal this weekend, very thoughtful op-ed, in which he basically is making the argument that there's a huge chasm that's emerged between, as she takes a shot at the so-called wise men, uh, maybe she would have put with Marissa here, she would say, wise men and women, and America. And she says, notice, guys, the wise men's credibility is substantially diminished, and by the president going out and arguing, or folks like us making our arguments, somehow it's not selling. That is to people. So what, what do you make of this? Yeah. Well, why, wise men when they're addressing the American people should not use the word norm. Because in many parts of the United States, that's a name. And people are still trying to work out why they should go to war for norm. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's Harvard Law School talk. Uh, and, and I do think, again last night, the president made his argument to the American people in language of excessive complexity. He made an argument that was far too elaborate and which in fact involved a 180 degree turn from arguing for action to arguing against it. I mean, I mean, I don't blame the American people for being baffled and unconvinced. But I want to echo something that, that Joe said. There is a pattern here uh, which is very distinctive to the United States. I wrote a, a book called Colossus uh, around about the time of the invasion of Iraq in which I said that the United States is bound to fail as an empire. It, it has imperial impulses for all kinds of reasons, but it's bound to fail because of three deficits. It's a manpower deficit because Americans genuinely don't want to go and spend time in hot, poor, dangerous countries. 
There's Especially a fiscal, if there's diarrhea. There's, yeah. there's that. There's a fiscal deficit. And that, even in 2003, was already a headache. Think of it now. The biggest deficit is the attention deficit. And Americans just lose interest after a while uh, in just the kind of cycle that Joe describes. But what's wrong with that? The problem is, if we lose interest in the Middle East, which we're in the process of doing, ah, yeah, enough already, what is going to happen there? Exactly what always happens when Americans lose interest. Americans lost interest in Europe after World War I. Ah, enough with Europe. But the longer you leave the problem, the worse it gets. Until finally, from a much less advantageous situation, you have to do something. And that's what's going to happen here. Not under this president, because I think he has blown it. But under his successor, let's assume it's Hillary Clinton, who has clear memories of the 1990s. I can well imagine a situation in which, after the breakup of Syria, which is where we're heading, the disintegration of Syria is going to make the disintegration of Yugoslavia look like a teddy bear's picnic in terms of mortality and in terms of regional ramifications. Why? Because the breakup of Yugoslavia involved the sort of death throes of a certain brand of, of Slavic nationalism. The breakup of Syria involves sectarian conflict between the Shia and the Sunni and radical Islam. The stakes are much higher the death toll will be higher, and the regional destabilization will have far greater implications for the United States than anything that happened in Bosnia, much less Kosovo. So eventually, after we've turned away from this, and the American public's going, no, 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 la, 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 I can't hear you, I can't hear you, who's norm, who's norm? You know, eventually, it will be necessary to go and sort this mess out, but only after God knows how many people have died. Notice, by the way, more people have died in the Middle East violently during the Obama presidency now than during the Bush presidency. Okay. Okay. So doing nothing and saying, I don't do intervention, can end up costing more lives than having a clear strategy, which after 9-11 Bush did, you may not have liked it, but there was a clear strategy, to intervene and to try to cause a democratic wave in the Middle East. That was the strategy of 2002. In the absence of a strategy, and my main criticism of Obama has been all along that he has no foreign policy, there is no strategy, we have ended up with a higher body count in the region, and it's going to keep going up this year and next year. If you don't believe me, look at the IISS database. The numbers are truly shocking. Okay, I don't think we're going to resolve this issue, and I don't want to refight the Bush administration oh, go on. debates this way and that tonight, because I want to keep us focused on... Syria, and I want to get to the audience. There are microphones on the floor as well as in the loges, but I want to call on the, 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 the Harvard has so many fantastic folks here that are relevant for this topic. I want to call on Gary Seymour first. Gary is the new executive director for research at the Belfer Center, and until about four months ago, he was President Obama's czar for weapons of mass destruction in the White House. So this would have been in his inbox. Gary, you comment on whatever you want to and then put in any question you'd like. Well, the first thing to say is <clears throat> I'd be very happy this isn't in my inbox. You're often asked to make the best of a bad situation in government. And I think the immediate challenge facing the administration is whether they can make the Russian proposal effective or expose it as a fraud in a way that frees the president to take military action without going back to Congress. Because I think he clearly must recognize now that he's not going to win a vote in Congress on this issue. And it was a mistake, it was a miscalculation to uh, expect that he could win such a vote. So if you're confronted with the need to either make the Russian proposal work or expose it as a fraud, which I think it is, because the Russians won't support the kind of strong threat of military action that would force Assad to actually give up its nuclear weapons, you've got two choices. And I think uh, Nick uh, Burns and Joe Nye laid out two different options. One is to take a very tough line on what you would require in the UN Security, Co in the UN Security Council resolution, which we know the Russians are not prepared to support, and that would, that would destroy the Russian proposal quickly within a week. Or you could take the approach Joe and I proposed, which is to accept a weak resolution, knowing that it's not going to achieve the objective, but at least allowing this process to play out a little bit further, create more distance, and at some point in the future, 
when it's become clear to everybody that it's not actually um, going to result in disarming Syria, that's when you pull the plug and the president's then free to act. So I think the question for the panelists is, uh, and this is the kind of issue they're going to be discussing inside the administration and with our allies as we uh, work on the resolution, is which approach do you take? Do you take an approach that leads to a quick collapse of the Russian proposal, or do you take an approach that plays along with it for some period of time and then hope that you can maneuver yourself in a position to expose it and then be free to act? Good. So we won't try to get everybody to answer every one, but basically since this is Nick and uh, Joe, Nick, yes or no, and Nick and, and Joe, yes or no? I think we are, Gary has framed it really well. I think we already know the answer to the question. The United States and France have already said we must have an enforcement mechanism. Putin's already said, you will not have one. So we're not going to have one, because the veto always works. So I think Joe's framing is the way it's probably going to turn out. We have to insist now, but it would be smart of us to have some kind of, off, uh, of commitment by the Syrian and Russian authorities to give up all the chemical weapons. Joe suggests Article 6 uh, of the UN Charter. But then it has to be accompanied in our own political system by something that would give the president the authority. If he's not willing to take it on his own, I think he should take it on his own shoulders. But if he's not, then this gang of eight in the Senate, including Senator McCain, may have the lifeline to President Obama. If the Congress would vote to support the diplomatic initiative, uh, but also write in an enforcement mechanism of our own in our system, we know that President Hollande already has constitutional authority that would then allow the United States to have the Article VI resolution in the UN that Joe's talked about, but in our own system, the authority for the president to go ahead and use force should we have to down the so road. Nick, I think that's where we're heading. Make, make sure your, your proposition is he's going to try to get a congressional, both houses of Congress, to authorize this, to allow, that's what you said, unless I missed. Yes. Yeah, so yes. you think it's realistic at this stage given that there didn't seem to be the votes there last week. I mean, presumably, when he was thinking about the options for the speech last night, one group said, let's ask for the vote now because it's only the threat of force that's actually got us to this point. That's a good argument. He made that argument. And somebody else said, I've been counting heads, and I don't think now is a good time to take a vote. Yeah. So, so is he going to get a vote? If he didn't get a vote now, he's going to get a vote, positive vote from Congress later? I don't know. My, my position is I wish the president would take this authority. By himself, I think he's yeah. got it and use it. And use the threat of force to hold Assad's feet to the fire right. as this very long and laborious process plays out of identifying the chemical weapons, sending yep. hundreds of inspectors in. You know, it's taken us 15 years to destroy our own chemical weapons. And the Russian program was now 21 years in. So we need the enforcement, whether Obama right. takes it on his own, whether, or and McCain, Congress. whether Congress gives him, in part of a diplomatic resolution, an enforcement mechanism. Uh, we need something. He needs something in order to have an effective policy. Okay, Joe. Obama wanted to use force for a limited purpose. He tried to do it with international legitimacy, even though it was illegal. He was going to follow the Kosovo precedent or other precedents, which is you do something which is regarded broadly as legitimate, even though not strictly legal under international law. That failed. He couldn't put together a coalition of the willing that was even as large as George W. Bush. So he's then suddenly stripped away with no international legitimization. And he then responds by turning to Congress well, let me get some domestic legitimization. And all of a sudden, he realizes he can't get that either. And then along comes Putin that bails him out of this. My proposal is let events happen. Make time play in your favor. Go ahead on the path you are now and ensue. And, and if you demand or require a one-week resolution, a tight timetable, you're back in the box you put yourself in in the first place. Let events occur. And when it proves that Assad hasn't done anything about his chemicals or is balking, then Obama says, I now am exercising my authority as commander in chief to get rid of these weapons or to strike in relation to these weapons, as I always said I would. And you say, where's your legitimization coming from? It's back to international legitimization. 
In the meantime, the UN no, but Security without a, without a congressional without a congressionalism, the UN has passed under Chapter Six a resolution saying Assad must do this. He doesn't do it, and Obama then says, "I have constitutional authority under the War Powers Act to do something like this, and I regard this as something that's within my powers as Commander in Chief." Okay, we're on the floor. Introduce yourself, uh, quick questions with a question mark. Uh, Chuck Kogan, formerly uh, Chief Near East South Asia and the Operations Director of the CIA and formerly Chief of Station Amman. I'm going to present an unpleasant truth. I was a member of a short-lived Iranian-American Track 2 dialogue, the centerpiece of which was a conference on the Iran-Iraq War. And we had a huge dump of documents from the National Security Archive. And what came out of these documents was the extreme position of the United States in favor of Iraq, although we claimed our neutrality. And one of the issues that arose during this period was the gassing of uh, Kurdish civilians at Halabja, and more importantly, the gassing of Iranian troops in the spring of 19, 1988, which led to the Iraqi ascendancy and the turn of the war in Iraq's favor. So in terms of order of magnitude, this was far graver than the August 21st event. And so I think we should keep this perspective in mind, because what did we do? Nothing. The faintest of slaps on the wrist. Okay. Anybody want to comment on that briefly? <laughs> Only very briefly. Yep. Yeah, no, I do think it's a, it's a great point, and it's a really important point to remember, because I think we're, getting, we're going down a bit of a rabbit hole. I think by focusing solely on you know, the chemical weapons and this, the incident of August 21st, um, and yes, I, I, we're looking at how to buy time just for that limited strike, just to deal with the chemical weapons. We're not looking at the bigger picture here, the broader problem of 100,000 people who have been killed by conventional weapons, an ongoing civil war that's likely to get more bloody. And as Neil said, how that's going to affect regional stability, al-Qaeda in the region, other, and other issues. So I think the biggest benefit of the buying of time is not just that it'll give the president uh, time to step back and then <coughs> use his own, own authority perhaps later to respond in a limited way. But I think it gives us time to really look at the problem as it stands and respond effectively, not just with military force. Again, we go back to humanitarian force. We go to, we don't have diplomats there. We haven't had diplomats in a year. We're not exerting any influence to try to change the game on the, gr on the battlefield with regard to the political dynamics of this, how to reach a settlement. And, of course, there was at a point discussion of arming segments <coughs> of the rebels to even the playing field so that that the political settlement could be reached more easily. And I think these are the discussions we should be having, not just how to deal with the UN resolution or the chemical weapons, but more broadly, are we going to do anything with the Syrian problem as a whole? Quick comment for sure. our, our hypocrisy and inconsistency on this issue, you're absolutely right to raise. I'm also glad you raised Iran because we haven't mentioned it enough in this discussion, but it's really the most important piece. The main beneficiary of what has happened here is not, in fact, Assad. It's Iran, because the US, having to a large extent damaged its credibility on the issue of chemical weapons, has almost no credibility in the eyes of regional players now on the much more serious issue of Iran's nuclear program. And that is going to be in the entree pretty soon. And I really do not like to think of how Obama is going to get anywhere on this issue. I spoke uh, with friends uh, in Israel today. There is a general perception that Israel is on its own on this issue. And there's another red line, which we mustn't forget, which is Prime Minister Netanyahu's red line. Increasingly, the probability is that regional players are going to take their own measures to deal with the Iranian nuclear program on the ground that the US is incapable under this president of even dealing with chemical weapons in Syria. Okay, in the lodge, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Sita Gofard. Um, I'm a junior at Harvard College, and uh, it's a, an honor and a pleasure to hear you all speak. I wanted to ask you about um, an, an argument that I hear very often from congressmen and congresswomen speaking on TV um, in regards to their opinion on Syria. And one of the things I've heard the most is that um, we should not intervene militarily because we don't know who the rebels are. Um, we don't know what type of government may succeed the al-Assad regime if, this, if, if we try to intervene. Um, and some of these rebels may be tied to al-Qaeda. And I wanted to hear your assessment. What, 
Uh, how, how strong of an argument do you think that is? And do you think it is uh, strong enough or serious enough um, or realistic enough uh, to, uh, to totally rule out the possibility of sort of military intervention in Syria? Anybody wants to do a short answer? Sure. Um, you, you saw the way that President Obama framed this over the last two weeks. He did not frame it as support for the rebels. And given the disputatious nature of the rebel movement and the, their divisive and the increasingly increased radicalization of the rebel forces, I don't think that would be a winning argument in front of the Congress. So the President framed it very narrowly on enforcement of the chemical weapons prohibition. And I think that the point that Marisa and I have both made now has to come into play. Where the United States can make a difference is in leading a greater humanitarian effort. And if we're not in the regime change business, I'll just repeat a point I made before, and we are definitely not, then I think that we should use our influence to work with others in the region to try to bring the war to a halt. That doesn't mean there's going to be a political settlement, but some kind of ceasefire. Incredibly difficult to do that. But that, for our strategic interests in the region, to prevent the widening of the war, if you're trying to do no harm, if you're trying to act with a little bit of restraint, then that might be the most effective thing we can do, the humanitarian effort and some kind of ceasefire agreement. Now, to link that to Iran, we won't get a ceasefire unless we talk to the Iranians, bring them in. I agree with Neil. We've set a very bad precedent in our behavior in Syria, looking towards the Iran problem. Prime Minister Netanyahu broke his silence today. And he came out with a public statement connecting Syria and Iran. So we need to show some toughness, as we've all been saying, I think, at the front end of this on chemical weapons, so we have some credibility on the Iranian issue. I think it's a great question, and one thing you may want to check out on this website, the UN uh, put out a statement today uh, accusing both sides in the, in the conflict in Syria of uh, uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity, both mm -hmm. sides. The gentleman in the loge. Hi, uh, my name is Aaron Maggot. I'm a graduate student in the Middle Eastern Center. I'm also in Professor Graham Allison's class, so you can blame me for his question. Um, I have a question specifically for Professor Ferguson. Um, you, were, you mocked, um, to a great extent, President Obama's handling of the war, and you were a bit glib about it. Um, and you proposed regime, regime change. So I'm trying to figure out, it's like very easy to be skeptical about someone else, but let's like, I, I have a few questions about your proposal. So. It, how is regime change going to be done without massive civilian casualties or a massive amount of American soldiers killed on the ground or America's image destroyed again or without allies like Israel, Jordan, or Turkey being attacked? So with the same level of scrutiny that you display towards President Obama, can we also see that towards your plan? Okay. Good. That's true. Neil, I think that's a question for you. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy to answer it. Um, I think there's a, a, a some failure to understand what is unfolding in the region and has been unfolding since uh, the fall of Saddam Hussein. And that, that is the collapse of a series of, of tyrannies uh, that uh, one could call a democratic way. And the United States, I'm not proposing for a second that the United States should be sending in the 82nd Airborne and rerunning uh, the Iraq war in Syria. My argument has been consistently that there was a need for a strategy once the Arab Spring began. Actually, there was a need for a strategy when the Green Revolution in Iran happened. And that strategy had to be decisive. Were we going to be supportive of this revolutionary wave or not? Because as we've seen in Libya, really small amounts of support, or in Egypt, no support whatever could suffice. Regimes have been changing, in case you hadn't noticed, rather frequently. I have noticed. So, so, <laughs> so it's not as if one needed, when this process began, to send enormous numbers of ground troops. Assad was reeling. He was extremely close to falling. But once again, the president, who has no strategy, has had no strategy since the Arab Spring began, other than not to be George W. Bush, dithered. By the way, to go back to the So what do you question, propose? Can I, can I just finish, <laughs> since you asked an aggressive question? <laughs> Which is perfectly, as long as it's polite, it's welcome. Yeah, good. The opportunity to act when the Free Syrian Army was not being infiltrated by Al-Qaeda and other non-Syrian actors was passed up two years ago, as I said at the time, and as others said at the time. We are in this mess. We have this high body count because of a, a, a lack of strategy, 
of inaction, of Hamlet-like indecision, the culmination of which we saw last night. I do mock it, because I was mocked last year when I wrote a piece for Newsweek, if I may finish, arguing that there were two central problems with President Obama. Number one, a very poor grip over Congress, including his own party. And number two, a complete lack of any strategy for the Middle East. I was mocked, and I was right. But you haven't proposed what you, haven't proposed what you do. I'm still waiting for an answer what you would actually do. Do you support sending in ground troops? What, you're saying he's wrong and I was right, but what do you want to do, either a year ago or now? So you have created this mess. I presume you're a supporter of the president, and you now want me to sort it out very well. <laughs> I understand you come to me now. It would have been smarter to have listened to the critique I made of the president's policy at the beginning of all of this, but since you come to me now, I can, I can tell you, it is now too late for the United States to intervene decisively in the Civil War. The Civil War will run its course as civil wars do. And finally, when the body count has doubled or trebled, we will participate, probably in the kind of diplomatic process that Nick is talking about, in the partition of Syria. And I hope you will be satisfied with that outcome, because it was avoidable. Okay. Gentlemen in the, here. Hi, my name. My name. You're good. It's working. My name is Christian Pico. I'm a Stanford grad, but I, I find Cambridge pretty nice, too. Um, That's okay. The weather will get worse. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till um, February. So my question is to those who answered yes to bombing. Um, since, since you're concerned uh, ostensibly about alleviating human suffering um, and um, uh, punishing those who develop or, or utilize uh, chemical weapons, uh, I'm just wondering whether you would also similarly advocate punishing, say, the Harvard University Chemical Engineering Department, which developed napalm in 1943, uh, or say the Dow Chemical uh, Corporate Headquarters, uh, whose product dropped 388,000 tons of napalm bombs on Vietnam. Uh, and this still kills thousands of people uh, every year. Um, it could be economic sanctions. You wouldn't need Tomahawk missiles. Um, so just, you know, if, if consistency and credibility regarding alleviating suffering is so important, would you similarly advocate punishing those groups? Who wants to try that? <laughs> Your turn, Jack. All right. I, I mean, I think it's a bit of a red herring, frankly. I mean, you're dealing with an issue of what do you do in policy terms with the situation now. If you set yourself a principle that you're going to alleviate suffering all over the world, and then essentially, why aren't we doing more in the Congo or the Central African Republic? I mean, there are all sorts of, my basic point is that we cannot go into other countries and manage them. The whole counterinsurgency, re rebuild states, nation building, is a profound mistake, which is why Neil and I disagree. The idea that we could have if we'd had a strategy, change these revolutions in the Middle East, I don't think we could have. I don't see this democratic wave that he sees. And therefore, the idea that you have to be perfectly consistent, including going back to issues of the 1960s and ask how you're going to punish long dead or emeritus professors in chemical engineering, strikes me as totally irrelevant. Because I don't argue for that type of petty consistency. I'm saying, given the situation that we're in now, what are the things we can do? And that's what I tried to express. So you're pouring to make me follow a principal consistency, which I did not enunciate. Okay. Please, this gentleman. My name's Bill. I'm here as an interested citizen. All right. Um, my question is, I wonder to what extent the panel feels that peaceful initiatives were tried, publicly tried, uh, up to the initiative of two days ago, uh, publicly tried by the United States, uh, were they sufficient, those, in, those initiatives that the U.S. might have taken? I'm aware, just for example, of uh, Samantha Power's uh, comment in the news, quoted in the news uh, a week ago, saying that, quoting roughly, uh, diplomatic initiatives, initiatives have been exhausted. Uh, without commenting on the merits of the recent Russian initiative, do you think the U.S. might have tried harder to come up with a solution that was um, more creative, using soft power, if you will, 
to um, come up with alternative, peaceful alternative solutions. And to the extent that it might not have tried to do so, why not? I think Nick, uh, Nick, Nick is the lead of the diplomacy initiative here. So you've been writing about this. Yeah. What would you say? I'd say thank you for your question. Um, I, I think that Secretary Kerry made a genuine effort last year to try to work with the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov on some kind of political arrangement that would have given greater humanitarian support to the innocent people suffering and would have led to some kind of political process that hopefully might have, um, might have lessened the effects of the war. The Russians stood him up. And the Russians have used the veto, and the Chinese have hidden behind the Russians at the Security Council consistently on every humanitarian intervention issue as well as political. So I think the administration made its effort and determined it couldn't work with the Russians and Chinese, and you've seen the policy since then. We talked earlier about the solution. I don't see a solution in the Security Council, ultimately. I think the solution is going to have to come in some ad hoc coalition afterwards. Who would be a member of that coalition? Turkey, certainly. Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. Iran is a possible member. If you want to be creative and diplomatically, a possible member of that coalition might be Iran on the humanitarian issue, greater support, and on a ceasefire issue. <coughs> and so I think there is room for creativity here. We're going to be in nuclear negotiations with the Iranians in five or six weeks. That's far more important strategically to us than what's happening in Syria in terms of our relationship with the Syrian government. So why not try to work with the Iranians in both places and test them? We haven't had a significant conversation in 34 years. It might not work, but we've got very little to lose on the Syria front by testing the credibility of President Rouhani. Interesting that President Rafsanjani criticized Assad. He was then pulled back, but it's interesting he did it. Interesting that President Rouhani has made statements recently against the use of chemical weapons without naming the Syrian government, referring to the Iranian experience at the end of the war with Iraq. So there may be some openings that we should pursue with Iran, as well as the other regional par parties, to be creative here. Good. This lady in the floach, please. Hi. First, I'd like to thank you all for being here this evening. My name is Molly Burson. I'm a sophomore at the college and a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. And tonight, I'm going to be asking the official Twitter question. How should the president respond to isolationist views? The president Bashar al-Assad's military regime presents no threat greater than any other threat our security faces on a daily basis, especially considering our relatively massive military power. Who wants to try that? Well, I'll, I'll answer in 140 yeah. characters. Yes, 140 characters is all you get. Yeah, I, I, think that, I think people are making a mistake if they characterize this period as isolationist. Look at the other part of the world, which is Asia, which is the dominant part of the world, the most aggressively growing part of the world. And notice that the president has announced a pivot or rebalancing toward Asia and that the United States is reinforcing its position and alliances in Asia. That's not isolationism in the sense that we had it in the 30s. You could argue that what we're seeing is a retrenchment and that this is very similar to what Eisenhower did in the 50s. Eisenhower was not an isolationist, but he refused to stay in Korea and accepted a stalemate. He refused to come to bail out the French at Dien Bien Phu in 1954. It was a retrenchment mainly a change in strategy. So again, Neil and I are friends, so we're differing tonight, but it's more fun to, to differ openly than to paper things over. I would argue that Obama's strategy for the Middle East is to work around the margins and the edges and not to get involved the way we did on the ground, because that will be too costly and make things worse. And in the meantime, focus much more heavily on East Asia, which is the heart of the world economy, that strikes me as a very coherent, sensible strategy. And the point that non-intervention occurs doesn't mean there isn't a strategy. And doesn't mean that it's necessarily isolation. And it's not isolationist. Okay, Certainly Eisenhower was not an isolationist. Right. We have oh, it's more than 140 characters. Right? <laughs> well, okay. Unfortunately, we have time for only two more questions. So this gentleman and then here, please. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Rory Arrow. Uh, I'm, uh, by, by, I'm based here at the Programme on Negotiation, and I'm writing a book on Jean Sharp, who's the theorist of nonviolent action, uh, whose books were used across the Middle East. Um, 
during the course of my research for this book, one thing that I was surprised at was that the Bush administration was far more active and willing to fund and train nonviolent movements than the Obama administration. In one cable from the Egyptian embassy, the uh, Egyptian um, um, the U.S. Um, uh, embassy in uh, Egypt, the U.S. ambassador complained he had so much money that he had funded nearly every single democracy promotion group inside Egypt, and he could not take any any more money. By the time we came to Syria, the Syrian activists that I interviewed said that while the Egyptians had received all of this training. The Obama administration had come in and had decided that they had to have a policy change and no longer fund these groups. In part, there was a chilling effect which came from the Iranians. When the US government funded the Iranian uh, democracy promotion project, the Iranians were so spooked by it that they threatened to withdraw from the nuclear uh, talks unless uh, the US government pulled off the democracy promotion project. And I just really curious um, to know from Nick Burns whether uh, the, the work of Gene Sharp and the strategic nonviolent action, which was laid down by the, in policy by the Bush administration, was followed through in any way, and whether he thinks that um, that that level of work should have been followed up to prevent the switch to violence uh, while the movement was still a nonviolent movement. Great question. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I can't really answer your question um, specifically, but I can say that uh, the Bush administration and I served in that administration felt very strongly that in the Balkans, particularly in Serbia, uh, and also in parts of the Middle East, we ought to be involved in encouraging um, non-government groups to build uh, a democratic future, if you can say that, in some of these countries. And so they're, they're, President Bush spoke to that. But you mentioned Iran. Um, I think that we've gotten to the point in this administration, I think President Obama is right, uh, to end the talk about regime change in Iran and to try to see if it's possible to have an historic set of conversations with the Iranians. Now that's got to be backed up by the threat of force and one of the possible casualties in Syria is that the threat of force on Iran is going to be less, less, less credible. And that's why President Obama needs to end the Syria crisis in a tougher position than he currently is in because Iran's more important. But I think if you take regime si change off the table, you do give the Iranians a chance to re-enter the international community to stop short of a nuclear weapon, to make some kind of diplomatic deal with the United States on the nuclear front. We'll know the answer to that question by the second semester. If talks start in October, November, I think there'll be extended talks, but as the President and Secretary Kerry have been saying, we don't have all the time in the world for those talks. Nick, do you think that no, no, strategic no, nonviolent action is a realistic alternative to military action? Do you think this administration thinks you that? Think that? Do you think that a realistic alternative to military action is support for nonviolent? It, it, it depends on the country you're talking about. Every country is going to be different. Okay, this gentleman gets the last question. My name is Henry. Sorry, do you hear me? My name is Henry Daher. I'm from Lebanon, and I have lived through the whole civil war. So my question is, I think the word limited is a very dangerous word because it could be limited from our perspective, but it could be enough for the rebels to, to make their attack and uh, topple the government and it would, be, it, be, it would become a messier environment after that, number one. And number two, why now we are suddenly reacting about, I mean, of course, August 21st is a, is a major event, but also at the same time, back in March, there was another chemical attack in Khan al-Asal no, but we did not hear about it. And number two, two months ago, using American bulldozers, American tanks, we attacked 500 people in Egypt, that, that they were in a, in a civilians, that they were in a camp. We attacked them and we killed 500 of them. Uh, but was it the case there because if it, it's a Saudi-led coup, so we did not raise any, any issue about it? Yeah. Well, I kind of agree with the implication of your question. I mean, the, the policy has been a sorry mess. Um, we've been distracted from events in Egypt by events in Syria, but you have to remind yourself of just how wrong this has gone from the decision to watch a Mubarak drop to the decision then to back the Brotherhood, which caused deep consternation through the region, and then the failure to help the Brotherhood survive as it self-destructed, and then the backing of what is indeed a a coup, largely Saudi and Emirates finance coup, which probably is going to fail. And the most populous country in the region is teetering 
on, well, on the brink of the kind of things that Lebanon saw for all too many years. I, I have to say that the ultimate indictment of this president's failure will be to see the face of Lebanon, that, that protracted civil war that tore your country apart, occur in the entire region. And there is a very serious danger of that happening right now. And I'm afraid to say that uh, the way in which the debate has been conducted over the last few days only increases my sense of foreboding about what the future holds. Certainly nothing I've heard from my esteemed colleagues tonight leads me to feel more optimistic than when I arrive that we're somehow going to devise a strategy and establish peace in Syria or anywhere else. So my, I, you know, my sympathies go to the people of the region at this point. They, they must feel betrayed yep. in so many different respects. Right. It is hard to see how the United States can have much credibility in the eyes of the old guard or of the revolutionaries of any side. We've managed somehow to alienate everybody, and that is yeah. really quite a sad achievement. Okay, so I'm very sorry to have to bring this to a conclusion because we could continue for quite a long time. I think they've been excellent questions, and actually it would be worth, certainly for our gang, doing another round for ourselves on, okay, so if the likely future is Lebanon for the region, or continuing revolutions in which the U.S. impact will be at the best, at best, at the margins. What do we think about that? And does anybody have a better idea than just letting that happen? Okay, so I would say there are huge questions here for students in the school. What a fantastic opportunity of things to think about. Absolutely, and I think there's no question that there's no monopoly of wisdom on these topics in Washington or in Congress or indeed even here at Harvard. So uh, tonight, as I told you at the beginning, you get a chance to vote as if you were a member of Congress. And in Congress, you get to choose only two choices, yes or no. And the resolution before the House is the resolution that President Obama put to members of Congress which is to authorize the president's using armed forces to prevent or deter the use, of, the use or proliferation of chemical weapons. You can vote yes or no. If you want to vote yes, you push one. If you want to vote no, you push two. And you've got 30 seconds to vote. Make up your mind if you want to be counted. You want us to vote? Yes, please. You're welcome. No, you can just, uh, if you just push yeah. one or two, How many times can it's I supposed to register. Is this Chicago rules? <laughs> no. And, it only works once. Uh, <laughs> you're, e even though Joe's accustomed to voting early and often, <laughs> you, your machine will only vote once. <laughs> Okay. This is a this is a new wrinkle yeah. for the forum, so we're Kennedy seeing whether we can follow the rules. <laughs> Chicago rules. So let's Absolutely. see what happens. Okay. Here's the. Here you go. Okay. So as we can as we can see from the vote, that were public. If this group were in Congress. It would not authorize the use of force in this situation. So I would say to our panelists for stirring the pot of a conversation that's going to go on for all of us for some period of time, let's say thank you very much. Thank you.